Thanks for staying with us now. BBC tweeted today that the director of Africa Center for Disease Control said in Africa, the daily coronavirus cases are almost double what they were six months ago. And so he said it is vital we get the prevention message out there. Now, currently, there are over 2.8 million cases and over 68 thousand deaths in Africa. So in our attempt to spread facts, not fear, how much do you know about the new strain of this COVID-19 uh, virus and why are we getting higher numbers of infection with some leading to death, as we had mentioned earlier? So please let us hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at WayShowAfrica1 with the hashtag WayShow or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-8038-4663. All right, so Timmy, quickly, I want to ask you this question before I bring in Dr. Maja Kudumi. How much do you know about this new strain of COVID-19? Well, I'm not sure which part of it is um, is information and which part of it is uh, fake news because I've seen a lot online. But I know that it's much more deadly than at least from official sources say that in the past two weeks, yeah, there's been a lot of um, reports, at least from um, our own health sources, say there's been a lot of reports of the second strain of this um, COVID virus. I know that it's much more deadly. I think I would like to look forward. That's one of the things I'm looking forward to, to learning much more about it. But um, I'm not sure COVID is COVID. <laughs> because, you know, someone made a statement that said, ah, COVID is COVID. But this one seems much more dangerous. Um, Absolutely. I don't know the medical terms, but it seems much more dangerous. And I look forward to actually learning much more about it. Yeah, it's, it's really deadlier than, you know, than what we had seen before. And I'm so happy Dr. Majikudumi is here because I remember he was one telling us then in April, when we had him April 2020, when he was saying that, oh no, that some people will heal naturally. They don't even need to go to, and it actually did happen like that because a lot of people caught the infection, but they didn't need to go get any medical help. Their body just, you know, healed themselves and all of that. So I'll bring in Dr. Tosin Majikudumi. He's a medical uh, medical uh, director and chief of cardiology Eurocare Nigeria. He's a dual citizen with Nigerian British nationality and he is an international cardiologist with specialization in both adult and pediatric heart disease. It's so good to see you again. Well, nice to see you too. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Thank you so much, Dr. Magic Kudumi. So um, you listen to Tammy, you listen to me. The truth is, honestly speaking, I am completely ignorant of this new strain of COVID-19 and the second wave that we are going through. So if a lot of people that are watching are like me, that don't know jack about it, what would you say is this new strain about? And I mean, why are we having a second wave? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so again, thanks for having me back. And I, I sympathize with your position, as well as those of a lot of the audience who are listening, because um, just as a lot of you are confused, even those of us professionals are actually wow. similarly confused about what is going on with this virus. And the problem we currently have, dating all the way back from early part of last year is that we are learning about this virus as we move along. Mm. So when people come to us and ask, ask us questions, um, we don't always have all the answers. For example, there was a time at the beginning of this pandemic when we, those of us who treat some of these patients were told, no, steroids don't work in, this, in, in these patients. Then later on, a few months later, we got a very nice study that showed that steroids were very effective in treating the severe forms of people who have this infection. Mm. Um, and so people sometimes get confused, but, but didn't you just tell us that we were not supposed to use steroids? Now you're telling us we should use steroids. But didn't you just tell us this? Now you're telling us that. And so I sympathize with it. But the, 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 the only things that we know so far about this new strain it's new, so uh, the information is limited. It seems to be more contagious. Mm. So it seems to be this, uh, I saw a report that said it was between 50 to 70% more contagious than the strain that we started with in the early part of last year when we first met. The good news about this new strain is that although it seems to be more contagious, which is why we are seeing a lot higher numbers now than what we've seen before, it does not appear that the vaccines that have been produced it seems that those vaccines will still be able to be protective against this new strain. Mm. Uh, so that's good news. That at least there's the means of protection that everybody has been working so hard to get haven't suddenly been nullified by this new strain of virus. So mm. I think people should be very cautious in this day and age of the sources of information because we are seeing a lot of information out there that is circulating on everybody's social media mm -hmm. that are coming from dubious sources. And I think people really need to pay a lot of attention now that there's a lot of scaremongering going on. But where 
they get their information from. And it's going to be the tried and tested, boring, old-fashioned sources of information. Maybe it's BBC or, or CNN UN. or UN or, or WHO. WHO. Those are the places where people would need to sort of look to to get their information. What your neighbor says or what your grandma says what your or what your said. pastor says <laughs> may not necessarily be accurate. I think people should really try and go to authoritative sources of information. Absolutely. Tammy, you want to come in here? Yes. I, well, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I like how you started by saying that we are all, even the medical practitioners, are even like getting to know much more about it. It's a little scary, but, um, but thank you for you know, letting us know that. So I would just like to know, you know, you mentioned that there's a vaccine that is um, already supposed to be for the first um, strain of COVID. And, you know, this is a second wave. If if it already, if there's a second wave, doesn't it kind of defeat the purpose? Would you still, because that was my news before we started, came into this um, session about how that WHO says, oh, this vaccine is safe, but then some people are still a little skeptical. So if this vaccine probably doesn't even cover this second wave, is it still advisable? I mean, what's your take on it, taking the vaccine? Okay, so two things to say. I think just to uh, go back to what I said earlier, the initial information that we have suggests that the vaccines that have been developed are going to be effective even against this second strain. Mm -hmm. So that part is good news. Uh, the other part, which I think is uh, the most substantial part of your question, is the issue of skepticism around this vaccine, and it is widespread. Uh, before I came on air, um, I uh, overheard you talking about the fact that some medical practitioners have some skepticism about taking this vaccine, and you're quite correct. I know quite a number of my colleagues who are a little bit skeptical about taking these vaccines for various reasons. You know, the speed by which it was developed, um, the, the, the anxiety around other motivations that, have met, that, have met, that might have led to speeding up the development of these vaccines. Maybe yeah. not all the usual steps were covered. And those are all very understandable uh, concerns. Uh, the one thing that I would say, though, is that speaking to my colleagues who are in other countries where they started to roll out the vaccine, in the UK, in the US, I saw a report today that said um, in the US they've already vaccinated, I think, 4.8 million people. Mm. Now, with the level of um, scrutiny that, is, that exists currently on this vaccine, if 4.8 million people are vaccinated and there were some significant problems, we would have heard about it. Okay. And, I, I, you know, <laughs> this goes back to the point I was talking about. Even if you don't 100% trust some of the old-fashioned authoritative sources of information, such as the WHO or the UN, etc., still stick to um, them. Still stick to them. Um, but we would have, uh, the, it's very difficult to keep true information quiet yeah. in this day and age. It will come out. Mm -hmm. And so far, we're not hearing a huge Any amount of news. problems. You're, you're hearing the expected amount of uh, issues, but nothing more substantial than that. So I think people should be reassured about taking this vaccine. Okay, so I'll come back to that, but I just wanted to quickly take a comment from one of our audience, Neka, in line with what she just said. She said there was a senator in the U.S. that took the first dose of um, vaccine and just caught COVID. Please clarify why. Okay. <laughs> so again, this is one of the things that... Well, well, <laughs> Tammy, you're laughing. <laughs> yeah, so you're this laughing is, too. <laughs> so this is a very but interesting it, it thing. It's really not funny. It just sounded funny. But it that's it that's is, that's my sister. It, you see, this is where a lot of people are scared. Let us bring it home. We're not yet going to speak grammar. Because you see, how can somebody take a vaccine and still catch COVID? Like, I, I thought the vaccine was supposed to protect me. I understand. And this, is where, <laughs> and this is where I think those of us in the medical community and the scientific community need to do a better job of communicating exactly mm -hmm. how vaccines work and the principles. I mean, today I've had to give a statistics lesson to a number of patients who I've seen with COVID because they said they, they would say to me, oh, I got tested for COVID and I was negative, but you're still telling me I have COVID because some other things are telling me I have COVID. And I tell them, I said, look, even if the test is 99% effective, but you test a million people, even if it's 99% effective, that means what? About a thousand people will have a false negative test. And wow. the test is 99% effective. So you can expect on a test that you are going to get some results that are not going to make sense. Mm. In terms of um, the vaccine itself, 
when we vaccinate people, it takes the body time to build up immunity. Mm -hmm. You don't get vaccinated today, and as soon as you walk out of the room where you are vaccinated, you are immune. <laughs> Okay, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. It takes time and the amount of time varies from one person to another. There are averages depending on what kind of immunity you're talking about, whether you develop some short term immunity or also the long term immunity. Mm -hmm. So if this senator, I don't know the details, but mm -hmm. if he got vaccinated on Wednesday and got COVID on, two, on Friday, that is not out of the realm of possibility, given mm -hmm. the fact that he's probably not had sufficient time for the vaccine to have um, developed his uh, immune, immune, an immune response yeah. that would now protect him mm -hmm. from further infection. Okay. All right. So let me come back to the question of this new strain of COVID-19. Because I remember when we had you, I mean, you really gave us a lot of hope and assured us that no matter what, there's 80% chance of actually self-healing. And I, that stuck to my head. And Good. so whenever I saw anyone, I tell them, calm down. It's not the end of the world. You would, your body would even self-heal itself. With this new strain, how deadly is it, you know? Is it the same um, um, mechanism that it's following or this one takes a, a um, huge toll on your health, even though if you are healthy? You know, why I ask um, this question, I took a story just now before you came in. Um, the deputy governor of um, Lagos State, his brother died today, doctor. He's also a medical doctor and he's 37. Mm -hmm. So before, before this new strain came, in my head, COVID is for aged people mm -hmm. and uh, people that have pre-existing. I mean, I mean, that was why we brought you pre-existing health conditions Correct. and all of that. But today, we're seeing younger people dying of COVID. You know, in fact, the old people is not one. So, and you know, people have you know told me that this new strain is just as it pleases. If it infects two people, you can take one and leave one. So, tell me, is this true? So the, what we know about this new strain, remember we're still learning about it because it's new. Yeah. What we think we know about it is it does not seem to be, in quotes, deadlier than the previous strain, but it does seem to be more contagious. So if I were to try and give an example, in the old strain, if you had somebody who was infectious in a room with 10 other people and they stayed together for half an hour, maybe, let's say, three people in that group would would. Uh, catch, it. catch the disease. With this new strain, you have that one person in a room with 10 people, maybe now six Seven. people mm. may catch the disease. But the severity of the disease or their likelihood of dying does not at this moment seem to be any different. Mm. In, to come to your point about older people, people with pre-existing conditions, that is still the case. That has not changed. Okay. We are still seeing mostly the people that tend to either have a bad outcome or, heaven forbid, die from this condition are older people with pre-existing conditions. Mm. Of course, just like I mentioned earlier, even if the strain 99% affected people above the age of, say, 60, and it's only 1% of people less than that that it affects, that is still, when you spread it out over a large number of people, you will still see quite a number of young people here, there, and there mm. who will get it. The vast majority will make an uneventful recovery, mm. but there will be a few that will have an unfortunate outcome. Mm. And that, for COVID is not substantially different to other problems. You see people who die from malaria. Mm. You know, a lot of people get, get better, but some people still pass away from malaria, um, who you wouldn't normally expect to pass away from it. So at least the, the disease pattern, um, its severity does not appear to have changed. The fact that it's more infectious is of concern, of course, because it means that people need to remember the core messages that we keep on preaching to everybody. Yeah. Wear a mask, social distance, mm. good hand hygiene. Those are the things. And one of the things that has also led to the accelerated spread we're seeing currently, certainly from my practice, is generally one of the questions I, know, I didn't ask at the beginning of this last year. What I asked now is, have you been to a party recently? Hmm. Have you been to an event recently, whether it's a wedding, a funeral, an event? Almost certainly that is where the vast majority of people currently who have caught it in the second wave, that's where they've caught it. Because of course, after the first wave and everything died down, um, people let their guard down. Hmm. You know, and we opened up the economy and opened up all the event centers and people started going to birthdays and parties. And swimming. Sure, swimming. We saw, we saw the pictures on the beach where people were there together and everything like that. Mm. So that has contributed in addition to the fact that we have a more contagious uh, virus mm. to get in this second So it's going. actually more vicious compared to the other one. Tammy, do you want to come in here? Yes, I do. I was just going to say that um, 
the way he put it about being contagious, but maybe not as deadly, but being contagious just gives a clear picture of the reason why social distancing is still very important. Absolutely. And the analogy he used just made it much clearer. And so I'm sure that the last time you were here on the program, I'm sure that you must have talked about how to, because I noticed that in the course of your conversation, you mentioned the body's immune system and how important it is. And I'm sure you must have talked about the last time you were here, but perhaps for the sake of people who were not on this, com or who did not listen at that time, I would just like you to talk about how to build, I mean, some people have not tested negative, some people uh, are not tested positive rather, are asymptomatic and all of that. So how can we build our immune system, you know, just even while practicing social distancing, how can we just get prepared and just build our immune system and just be healthy? Well, well, I think immune system uh, conversation will come at the later part, but there's a very funny, uh, Tammy, he will take that question when we go on that, when we go on the second break and come back, right? Um, okay. Let me quickly say, I, the person didn't drop his name. He said, why is it that the victims are prominent people, right? Um, in my area, I haven't seen nor heard anybody who died of COVID or, or has COVID. I'm sure he's living in a, you know, not so touch area. <laughs> So this is a conversation that I have seen play out in a lot of places where people think COVID is a rich man disease, mm. right? So why is this conversation still happening? Well, in, in a sense, if you live in an area where um, there isn't as much affluence, say, as in other areas, it may actually be the truth that your reality suggests that you're not seeing a lot of COVID. And the reason for that is um, people who are affluent tend to be older. Mm -hmm they will tend to have more pre-existing conditions, but maybe because of their lifestyle, they're mm -hmm. more likely to be obese. Mm -hmm. So they may have hypertension, diabetes, and all the other risk factors. Yeah. And so they may get affected more. And also we know that those who are more affluent tend to live longer. Mm -hmm. And so they will be, tend to be the older part of the population that are more likely to get a severe form of the disease and pass away from the disease. Absolutely. One of the things that we have been talking about in this uh, pandemic has been that um, in Africa and Nigeria also, we've seen that the death rate seems to be a lot lower, lower yeah. than it has been in other countries. And a lot of people have put forward lots of theories for that. One is that we're a much younger population than they have abroad. Um, a popular statistic in Nigeria is that I think 70% of our population, of our 200 million, is less than the age of 30. Hmm. So when you think about a huge population who are all very young, they are very likely to have very mild, non-specific symptoms or be asymptomatic, or even if they get ill, they will recover very quickly. Mm. Um, the vitamin D association has been mentioned that you know people who have uh, higher vitamin D levels tend to have less severe yeah, disease, we the and we have that from the sun because we're the kind of climate that we have. Mm. Um, and there's also, there was a very interesting study also from the New England Journal of Medicine, which I read recently, that also talked about the fact that they did a study to look at the cross-reactivity of coronaviruses in African populations compared to European populations compared to American populations, mm -hmm. and they found a quite a strong react, cross-reactivity of antibodies in African people, whether you, um, in people who had not had coronavirus, compared to people in America or people in Europe, mm -hmm. suggesting that in our environment we're more exposed to coronaviruses, which give us some built-in immunity mm -hmm. more than in populations where they are not exposed to these viruses Absolutely. on a more uh, frequent basis. So all of those may contribute to the guy who wrote in saying that, in my, well, in my community, I'm not, I'm not seeing this. I'm not seeing this. And that's a reflection of his reality. He may be mm -hmm. correct. Maybe he's not seeing it. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It and it also doesn't, and also means that he has to be careful because a lot of people are being misdiagnosed. Is a lot of people are still being said they have malaria and Everybody typhoid. has been treating malaria for the past three weeks. Needs to be very careful. <laughs> I, for the moment, it's, it's almost like we can joke and say, right now in, in Nigeria, we've suspended malaria and typhoid for a while. <laughs> this is now COVID until, until uh, proven otherwise. Dog, Everything is... Every hospital you go to, yeah. you have fever, you're running a um, temperature, they'll tell you you have malaria. Correct. So we need to go back to that basic that how do we even start to get hospitals to be responsible enough to test for COVID first before they say they want to test for other diseases I think and other sicknesses. I think you're absolutely correct. <laughs> I think these days your first port of call needs to be yes, COVID, COVID and first, then anything then else, else afterwards. Absolutely. But I would like to stress this point. Um, yeah. As much as COVID of course exists and is taking up all our consciousness at the moment, 
people still have other things going on. Definitely. Not everything is it's COVID. We know. And it would be very sad for people who have a treatable condition because of the stigma possibly associated with COVID, have that overlooked and die from a possibly treatable, possible treatable condition, condition because yeah. everybody is scared about COVID. Absolutely. Okay, you know what, Timmy, we're going to go on a very short break. When we return, we'll continue the conversations. Please stay with us. We'll be right back.